three. The dawn of satellite television, 1968. Today, we take satellite TV for granted. Thanks to these satellites flying around above our heads, we have instant access to events anywhere in the world. That all began to change in 1962 with a satellite named Telstar. Now, I recently found an article from 1962 that takes us back for a glimpse of these early days. If you'll pardon the pun, the article takes off as follows. This month, space satellites are supposed to take off their lab coats and roll up their sleeves for bread and butter work. The first job is a glamorous one that everybody can enjoy. The long-promised direct look by a television at U a European sites. The working satellite is uh, Telstar, a three-foot magnesium ball that is faceted with 3,600 solar electric cells on the outside. Inside, it's filled with complex receiving and transmitting gear cushioned in pink foam, end quote. Telstar was supposed to relay TV signals between ground stations in Europe and the United States. For the very first time in history, those of us here in the United States would be able to see what was taking place on another continent at the very moment that it happened. Well, actually, there would be an infinitesimal delay of one thirtieth of a second because of the time it took for the signals to travel to and from the Telstar satellite. But back to the actual article, and I quote again, the very first satellite TV show for home consumption only will bounce live pickups from the main ground station at Andover, Maine via Telstar to a smaller station at Holmdel, New Jersey. And a few weeks later, the transatlantic program's direct views of scenes, uh, scenic points in Europe and America will follow. Because of the time zone differences, Americans will get their first live TV of Europe in midday around 2 p.m. Eastern Time, end quote. Only Telstar, a transatlantic satellite, could do the incredible task. At the time, TV programs were sent between cities via beams of microwaves. But in order to get around the, uh, the curvature of the Earth, the signals must be received and retransmitted. The higher the relay tower was, the greater the distance the signals could cover. However, to send a microbeam across the Atlantic, a relay station on a straight line of sight from both Europe and America had to, had to be in place. And the only way that could be done is uh, using s satellite. Telstar moved fast, and its orbit shifted relative to ground points. That little ball of, sat of a satellite circled the Earth at 16,000 miles per hour and at a 45 degree angle to the equator. The article continued to explain, and I will quote again, on several of its um, eight daily passes, it will cross, across, it will cross the Atlantic far to the south, completely out of our view. At best, it will stay in the Europe-American line for 50 minutes. Even then, transatlantic telecasts will be limited to about 10 minutes each because the power limit of its uh, batteries before solar recharging. To get around these limitations, a full-scale system of intercontinental communications uh, satellites would, re would be required, 2250 satellites in all, circling the globe at the same time. Such a system is planned to be in orbit by 1967, end quote. Before Telstar, several test communications satellites had been sent into orbit. However, it was Telstar that handled the first regular TV shows, and Telstar also carried telephone and telegraph traffic as well as, <clears throat> as, well as having had the ability to make scientific measurements. Telstar was built by AT&T and was launched from Cape Canaveral on a Douglas three-stage Delta rocket. AT&T paid $3 million for the one-way trip into orbit for Telstar. Telstar's orbit was designed to allow it to circle the Earth for a uh, long time. However, despite their protective covering um, the, of the solar power cells with clear sapphire, um, they realized that uh, they would gradually be knocked out, of, out by meteors and particles from ra the radiation belt. It was estimated that within one year, the power cell's total output would drop from 15 watts to only 11.5 watts. After two years, an automatic timer will cut off the continuously operating beacon transmitter so that its frequency can be used for other things. The remaining equipment will be turned off and, on as, and, and off and on as needed by ground signals. The Telstar didn't last as long as was hoped because of atomic tests in the upper atmosphere. The extra radiation in the uh, Van Allen radiation belt caused uh, systems or transmitter transistors to fry, and so the little uh, the little satellite that made history was not long lived, but it did change communications worldwide. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed the program. Thanks for listening. Uh, please leave, give us a thumbs up and subscribe so that you don't miss any programs here on the Dennis Morrison channel. God bless and have a great day.